Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Reporting Insights for Librarians, brought to you by Open Athens and EBSCO. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. We encourage plenty of questions throughout the webinar. At any time, place your questions into the Q&A box on the right hand side and the presenters will address them after the demonstration. Uh, if we do not get around to all your questions today um, or you just want more information, please do not hesitate to get out of touch with us directly and also at the end of the webinar there will be a quick survey um, which will only take a minute plus you can request a call back then as well. Finally if you have any technical issues please send me a note in the Q&A box and I'll get on to that as soon as possible. Okay now I'd like to introduce today's guest Adam Snook, Product Manager from OA Open Athens is joining us from the UK and Mike McKinnon, Software as a Service Innovation Director from EBSCO. Without further ado, I would like to now pass it on to Mike McKinnon. All right, thanks for that, Rob. Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the screen. If can't, uh, as Rob suggested, please uh, ping us in the Q&A box for some technical support there. Um, today's agenda, we're going to hope to really cover all the questions that you might have around using analytics with Open Athens. Uh, certainly an area where authentication analytics can help provide more robust statistics so the collection analytics you're already getting around search stats or counter statistics uh, that you may already use. Um, but we also want to talk about uh, how you can use different attributes and data points within those analytics to really tell some stories about usage itself. Um, I think that what I need to do here in order to be able to really see this better um, is I need to be able to hide something here really quick, so apologies. Okay, um, so without further ado, just some questions that you may really want to see. What is Open Athens going to do for me as a library? Well, first, you're already getting counter statistics, and the counter statistics that you have will give you statistics like uh, DB1s or DB3s, your JR1As for archives, so it's going to tell you about packages and resource uses that you have. But what they don't tell you are about instances where analytics are not necessarily triggered from a counter compliance standpoint, but where usage is being uh, used, where there, there is action happening, and that's libraries coming in, whether that's on campus or off campus, or sorry, patrons coming in, whether that's on, on campus, off campus, where they're coming in uh, to the um, full text itself, but maybe not actually downloading an item, so they are clicking through to the platform. Um, and overall, where uh, usage might be coming from that uh, helps you be able to reinforce that activity, so some information literacy, or where you may uh, um, need to grow some activity where um, usage isn't being used. So per, uh, whether that's at a collection that you have subscribed to and it's not getting any use at all, or maybe just simply difficulty of getting access. Um, Open Athens can provide that um, data story that counter statistics and circulation statistics don't tell you. Um, this goes back to budgets. A lot of libraries today, uh, I would think you know, the vast majority of libraries today have depressing budgets year over year. There's downward pressure on them. So making sure that you have uh, as high of a resource um, uh, return on investment is something that everybody's really driving towards, some data-driven decision-making around your collections. So this uh, Open Athens not only accomplishes being you know, SAML compliant over IP compliance, but actually really helps paint those pictures with the, the data stories too that Adam's gonna show us later. So if you're not using Open Athens today, you are using most likely Easy Proxy uh, from OCLC or you're using WAM from III. Um, I suppose there are libraries out there that might be using CASA from Google, but um, really that's just user-centric, not organizationally driven as a tool. And all of those tools, uh, well, with exception of, I suppose, Google CASA at the, the individual account level, but the, the tools, the institutional tools, WAM and OCLC, those are IP authentication tools. They are not SAML compliant, as I mentioned, that's um, the secure access markup language, the ability to have an individual token be pervasive across a user session. And thus, all they're really telling us is about that user's um, IP activity and that are they an approved user, yes or no, and that's it. 
um, there's not a whole lot of data there, and particularly around user attributes with no attributes being passed from the identity tool that you're using, whether that's a shibboleth server or an Active Directory uh, for student services data. Um, if, you're, if you're not passing any attributes from your IDP into that authentication tool, then you certainly can't get any analytics around those patron activities. So uh, around those patron attributes rather. So we really need to be looking at authentication holistically, not only for the issues around uh, security and privacy that IP doesn't offer, but in a way to be able to get granular statistics around those individual users. So uh, when you look at Open Athens uh, overall, Adam's going to show you several different reports in a, in a nice um, visual uh, dashboard. Um, the ability to look at groups of users, not uh, individual users, uh, if that's something that your organization is concerned about from security and privacy, but groups of users, uh, groups of attributes around those users, maybe they're alumni or faculty, um, and activity by either platform, publisher platform, by time of year, so maybe as the new semester kicks off and you want to make sure new collections have been put in place or even new workflows around access to collections are being used, that you can see those at a schedule that's appropriate or at a user attribute base that makes sense based on the analytic outcomes you're looking for. So this idea of a modern uh, authentication tool that allows you the ability to be secure and private as well as have robust reporting and analytics is something that is definitely in need today. Now, you probably have some of the, just on the description we've already had, you probably have some ideas in mind about how you might use it in your library. But there's definitely some use cases that have set precedent on how to do analytics based on authentication data. Now, if you look back over several years, there's actually been some authentication um, case studies that have been done with mapping uh, even proxy logs, right? Mining your easy proxy log data, comparing those logs with student services systems data, and then trying to create a story around uh, uh, all of your authentication uh, endpoint data. And in the end, that's a ton of work. If you look at all of the white papers around activities such as this, there's a ton of work that happens there that Open Athens does natively without any uh, real effort on your end other than just running the report. But we also need to make sure that as uh, the RA21 initiative from NISO takes uh, a hold within publishing as we look at you know, not just the three initiatives that are part of RA21, but we look at publisher adoption of RA21 principles. We're looking at SAML versus IP support and this migration of most mainstream publishers to SAML compliant platforms. So uh, we wanna make sure that we support that within the library as well. So with that, I'm gonna kick it off to Adam and we're gonna see a bunch of live demonstration within uh, the Open, Athen Open Athens Analytics portal. And then we can come back and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mike. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just share my screen a sec. Right, hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, you're good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is the Open Athens reporting dashboard. So this is the first uh, screen you see in in Open Athens reports. Uh, it's, it's more of a, an overview page, this initial uh, section. So you can kind of see over whatever time period you want, uh, be it the last 24 hours, seven days, 30 days, the most used resources, so the top resources. Uh, how many authentications, so that's uh, sessions being created within Open Athens uh, over that period, uh, how many accounts you have in the system. Um, so then the, the final thing is 
location. So where are all those uh, users? So we've got many users, uh, fairly active, and this is where they're uh, signing in from. So first, I should have done a disclaimer, uh, kindly using uh, Millersville, who have uh, given us permission to use them as a demo site. So this is actually a, a live uh, customer. So this is real data, not dummy data. <clears throat> um, the reporting interface is maybe nearly two years old now. Our primary goal, I guess, was rather than just giving rafts of data, uh, our goal was to visualize the data um, so that it makes it a bit more, I guess, human readable and I guess tactile or, uh, is probably a good word. And it, the aspiration was so that you explore the data instead of just seeing something, thinking, all oh, right, that's nice. Well, the idea is, is so that you can go and explore it in a bit more detail. So these are interactive. Uh, these things. So if you, for example, just click EBSCO, uh, this will uh, go in. Hmm, interesting. Uh -huh, that's because of the department. Uh, the idea is it, it then goes into that uh, area from the dashboard. Um, the breakdowns are remembered. So whatever uh, you used last will always be remembered. That was why uh, initially uh, it was set to department because I was uh, playing with this earlier. Um, just go through the whole interface, I think, from uh, the, the beginning. We've separated out uh, two lines of thought, I guess. There's just account information. So information about the accounts within the system. Not necessarily the individuals, but the accounts. Um, to make this a bit more relevant, I'm going to go back to the 1st of June to show why this may be useful. So account totals. So this is the total number of accounts within Open Athens. And as you can see, uh, it provides historical data. So this uh, is so that you get an idea of trends within the system. Uh, and the reason I went back to June, this was uh, when the uh, we started doing the setup for this organization. So as you can see, as the setup uh, carried on and then they went live, um, many accounts are being created in the system. Not only is it the, the number of accounts, but we also break it down by where they are, I guess, in their, you could call it life cycle. So status is whether they're active, uh, may be suspended, uh, as we have misuse monitoring to uh, temporarily suspend or uh, more uh, hardlined actually disable accounts um, if they're suspected of misuse. Uh, and of course, uh, accounts expire after certain periods of time. Type is uh, fairly useful. This organization has uh, what we call local authentications. They've hooked into their local directories and they're in this kind of partnership with three other uh, universities. So they've registered different local authentication systems or user directories within Open Athens. So breaking down by type um, kind of shows you how many accounts you've got from those different sources. And activity uh, is more around, again, the individuals doing things with their account. So be, be it deleting account, updating them, creating accounts, changing passwords, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Where it gets more interesting is around the authentications and usage. So authentications, I think I'll just limit the data to maybe the last, let's do three, four months. Just because otherwise it can get a bit busy, the, the more data you have. 
So authentications, this shows effectively all successful and failed authentication attempts. So this is individuals, users, patrons, whatever you want to call them, uh, trying to log in or sign in to Open Athens, and that either results in a success, so you're actually logged in, or a failure. And uh, we kind of show why it failed. It could be because that there was uh, they were suspected of misuse, so they're suspended, their account has expired, or they're entering the wrong password. Why, uh, you may ask, do we have two lines? This is showing the total number of, in this case, successful authentications. But uh, due to a very popular uh, request was wanting to know the number of unique individuals. So uh, in this case, there was a total of 627 uh, successful sign-ins but that was uh, 520 unique individual users uh, successfully signing in on that particular day. Then to explore the successes in a bit more detail, uh, you can then go into account usage. So this is a, a way of trying to understand all those actual users, the people successfully signing in, um, not necessarily what they're doing, but who are they? So you can break down these reports in a number of ways. Uh, this particular report I, I've broken down by permission set. Uh, you can kind of think of that as a user group, a user category. Um, it's, it's just a label uh, or, or um, attribute on an account that can be used for ultimately two purposes. One, uh, reporting. Uh, so you can break down your reports in a bit more, in a bit more detail. So here, this is uh, by um, type, I guess, type of user. So whether they're a student, faculty, uh, or from a different university. There are some default breakdowns uh, within the system, uh, but this is flexible. So, for example, uh, you could uh, break this down by individual user. Uh, I'm not going to show you that because it's obviously personal data. Um, but just to show all of these that are labeled an account attribute. You uh, this is completely flexible, so you can create any number of attributes and uh, add additional information into Open Athens for whatever reporting needs you have uh, but by default um, it, it's really just the anonymized pieces of information uh, that we have by default and that's by org uh, group uh, country so that you can kind of see where your uh, usage is coming from the good thing as well um, is you can kind of look at when your peaks and troughs, so the, the high user uh, activity days are, and clearly, obviously, weekends, uh, less so. So let's move away from the accounts and go into the resource usage. So this is, uh, say, platform, service providers, uh, databases, whatever, uh, content. Uh, what we typically mean by resource. Uh, much the same as account usage, uh, it's kind of trend type data, and you can break it down by uh, any kind of uh, breakdown you like. It's completely customizable. So here, by default, just stick into permission sets. This is effectively a total of totals. So this is all resource usage broken down by permission set. But if you're interested in breaking it down by resource itself, then of course you can do that by resource uh, and no secondary breakdown so that you can kind of see what the highest um, used resource is, etc. And again, you've got the whole total and unique, so you know uh, how in general 
busy that service is, but also how many individuals are accessing it. But otherwise you can do a multi breakdown. So if you want it broken down by resource and permission set, so you can kind of see that, that Millersville University uh, or, or students uh, at most levels actually, students are uh, certainly the most active uh, and for which services they are uh, using the most. With uh, these styles of report, you can also break it down by hour. So we've got three types of breakdown. Across long periods of time, monthly will probably be uh, a more sensible option. As I was showing before, uh, you can break down by day. And you can also break down uh, hourly. This is just because of the sheer amount of data uh, and data points. This is limited uh, to two weeks worth of data, but similar to the daily. So you can see uh, your peak days doing it by hour. It kind of shows you when, when your peak times are as well. Slight caveat, uh, we are a UK based uh, company. So the times, are actually UK times. Uh, it, it does not currently uh, pay attention to the locale of your machine. Uh, th this is in UK time. So if you would like to get certain reports uh, more regular, uh, so instead of having to manually go in and uh, set up your report to, to see what you're doing. Uh, as I mentioned, the breakdown is remembered. So when you log out and log back in, that, that breakdown is um, remembered, but it's still potentially cumbersome if you're doing that often. So what we've done is we've built a scheduling uh, tool. So you can actually schedule this type of report. So if you want resource usage, uh, broken down by resource and permission set, you can schedule that to run monthly, weekly, or daily. So in a, if you did monthly, on the first of every month, you'd get a report for last month. Uh, weekly, again, you'd get one on Monday for last week. And daily, midnight every day, you'd get a report for yesterday. You've got some options on how that is delivered. So you, the person that have signed in, uh, you can get it uh, so that a notification will be sent uh, directly to you. Uh, and that will just ha have a link and it will take you to the safe report. Uh, otherwise, if you want to share it with, for example, your manager or um, your business analyst or whatever, uh, then you can add additional people. And that will send a, a secure link to those individuals as well. They won't require a, a sign-in. Um, it, it's kind of a pre-authenticated link that goes to the individual. So if I just show you what one of those looks like. So we've here's one uh, we prepared earlier. Uh, so this was resource uh, report broken down by permission set. And this is a daily report. So they all appear in a bucket, a folder, uh, whatever you want to call it. And you simply uh, double click and that will open uh, that report that was scheduled um, every day. If you don't necessarily want uh, regular reports uh, on a specific interval, if there was a particularly interesting report that you um, had. So a prime example might be um, what I showed you originally. So if you wanted that kind of trend of your accounts, so went from when you started uh, to, to today, that's not really something you'd probably want to schedule. 
uh, account totals report. I'm not saying you won't, but it's unlikely. So you can, of course, just download th th this data. So you can save it to your computer, or you can create a save report. So this is going to be this effectively static report. Um, account totals. And that will always appear in the saved reports section. So not only do the scheduled reports appear, but let's just call them ad hoc saved reports uh, can be stored here as well. Uh, but, but that's really only if um, you've got something, it's an outlier report that you want to uh, reference or something. You can change the style from that line to a, a bar, if you like. Um, but otherwise, if you want more trend type data, then, then you can do that. I think that is largely everything from a demo perspective. Yes. Uh, Sounds good, Adam. You want to jump into the FAQ? Yes. So, uh, hopefully you can see that PowerPoint. Yep, all good. So, we do get um, a lot of questions uh, come up on every webinar. So rather than just open up to questions first, thought we'd cover off some of the frequently asked questions uh, straight away. Uh, one we get all the time is, can we view database or journal level reports? So rather than talk at you, I just want to go and show you uh, a visual. So the types of resource data we have is ultimately what the service provider, the vendor, the publisher has registered with us. Uh, not very often, but it, it is sometimes the case, they do register journals, but the vast majority of time they don't. And it will be the platform uh, that will be registered within our system. So key uh, examples here, EBSCO, Elsevier, Wiley, Sage, so it's not the individual journal article database, it's the platform that that vendor is registered, because that's all we have visibility of. Think of us as the, um, a slightly negative word, but I can't think of another one, gatekeeper. So we effectively accompany the individual to the front door of the vendor and uh, we, validate their credentials and so the authentication all that kind of thing then they're handed off and they're in the care of the vendor so we don't have any visibility of the individual journals articles or databases can we view usage for on campus versus off campus so on site off site on network off network uh, Yes, uh, to a degree. <laughs> so we do have, oh, sorry, uh, on the usage, uh, so account usage, not only do we show the kind of location by country, so this is uh, what, what obviously this is, we do have a network option. This, um, ultimately shows the domain where it's visible. Where the domain is public, uh, that's what we see. So if the user is from uh, Starbucks, you might see a starbucks.com or whatever, uh, but otherwise you'd see your university, your college, your campus domain there, and then everything that isn't your campus domain would be the off campus access. So here, if you see there is millersville.edu, that is their uh, campus network. 
everything else uh, would be remote uh, remote users. How will administrative access to reports be structured? At present, um, you have one administration account for each organization within Open Athens. Um, so if you have administrative access to Open Athens, you will be able to view reports. Um, there is an element of kind of sharing admin credentials, uh, but over the next, hopefully 12 months, hopefully not that long, uh, in the medium term future, we are looking at uh, changing the underlying uh, structure of Open Athens itself, so that uh, we'll be able to distribute admin accounts to individuals uh, but at the moment they're they're typically shared uh, but you can structure them however you like those organizations so if you've got multiple campuses you could create an organization for each one uh, for example if a different campus have, has different um, subscription needs uh, then you can structure it that way it's also important to note, if I can add really quick, uh, Adam, it's important to note that if you as an administrator of Open Athens, you could come in and create a report and then send those reports to other people that may actually just want the report itself. Don't need to necessarily be administering Open Athens, but you want the data, so you're going to send it to somebody else around data. And you can create reports, schedule those reports, automatically send those reports, as Adam's showing here. So, it's not like one person is the sole person that has access to the report. Um, that those reports can be sent and scheduled as needed to whomever needs to receive them. Yeah, awesome, thanks. Uh, how is unique versus total usage tracked? So I showed uh, what, um, oops, sorry, what, uh, that we have unique, what report was that on? That one. Um, in effect, every time someone, an individual, is transferred to a resource, to a, a, a vendor, we record an event. Uh, that on our back end system, we know that that was an individual user. We don't necessarily record who it was, so it's not personal uh, at that point, uh, but we record an event. So every single event uh, will go into the all, so that will be every single transfer uh, to a resource. But because we know each individual user, uh, we will not add anything to this number unless it was a different user being transferred to, to that resource. Uh, but of course, someone can log out of, in this case, EBSCO and log back in. We will record the event there, but we won't add another one to the unique. I think that was bad articulation, but uh, hopefully you get that. What if an attribute changes in our local directory. Um, the good thing about the way we hook into local directories is it's it's not um, what's the we don't necessarily do provisioning as such. Uh, so it's not always if you update something in your system, it will not. Uh, reflect that in Open Athens immediately. But every single time a user signs in to Open Athens, the local directory uh, that you have integrated with sends us a bunch of attributes. And if it was, um, I don't know, what's it, member number uh, or mobile number, whatever that is, if, if the data changes, we won't change old historic reporting data. 
but we will start every time we create a new event we will record the new um value for, for that user so it's always up to date at the time a user logs in Yeah, great. So we got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, I think if we're done with the FAQ, you want me to go ahead and go through those? That's fine. I think we'll do questions. Yep. Good deal. Okay, so uh, let's see here. I got a few questions from Susan. Thanks for those, Susan. Uh, how do accounts get added? Can we delete them rather than just expire them? Can we set it up so that people can't modify their accounts? Uh, yes. So in this instance, because I don't want to share any personal data uh, for a customer, I'm going into my demonstration uh, account to show you there are effectively two types of um, ways to sign in to Open Athens. One is what we call the managed directory. What we mean by that is you can create Open Athens user accounts. So this is a completely different username and password to whatever you use on campus. Uh, so this is my account. Uh, that is my username and I have a password. My account is due to expire. Uh, I can use my email address instead of the uh, username to sign in, which is much easier from a memorability type perspective. But I can't actually change any of this myself unless you have something called uh, self-registration, uh, which is basically something we build so that uh, people can update their accounts themselves. But we're seeing a, a trend away from using Open Athens user accounts because most people these days, not all granted, but most people have their own directory on campus or, or uh, within their organization, whatever. And local directory integration seems to be the preferred method now. So we've got many different connectors. Uh, basically, SAML, uh, would cover ADFS, Azure, Ping Federate or Ping Identity, Okta, many, many things. LDAP, so for example, Microsoft Active Directory. What we mean by that is we're using your credentials from your own system that HR or IT or whoever manages. That, uh, you effectively can't change anything on the account. Uh, because it's all managed, as I said, by HR or IT. So if I show you a local account, uh, these are effectively read-only cached versions of the account. So everything will come from the local directory. Uh, it will be mapped into Open Athens, and as you can see, it's all read-only because the definitive source is your directory. So a user can't change that unless they can change that information within your uh, system. Yeah, good. Can you show that um, we can delete the account rather than just expire them too? You showed your own account falling off. Ah, sorry, question. yeah. So, um, if you were using an Open Athens account, then you can just go in and delete it. Yeah, perfect. Because that's potentially very cumbersome if you've got 50,000 accounts. Uh, we also have something where we will automatically, oh, sorry, something there. Uh, where we will automatically delete expired accounts after they've expired within anywhere from zero to 365 days, which is basically just an, a way of automating the deletion so that you don't have to do as much housekeeping. And that same thing uh, applies to local accounts. 
uh, as well. So those, sorry, uh, those cached read-only accounts from X period of inactivity, we will delete that that record as well. But otherwise, you can uh, you can do that manually as well. Yeah, if the record still is, if that account is still in your IDP in, in your connector. If uh, it automatically comes in due to inactivity, I assume it would still get repopulated in Open Athens because it's coming from the IDP that is the source of origin for it. A hundred percent, yes. Yeah, it yeah. won't create a new account. They won't lose personalization because the same unique user ID would be used to sign them in. So that would be, I don't know, email address, username, whatever. Uh, it, all it is is deleting the the cached read-only record. Yeah, one of the things for everybody uh, on the webinar to see is from a workflow perspective at the uni, you know, you, you want to have an easier workflow with your students and their patron accounts coming into Open Athens, so you connect it to the underlying identity provider solution, your student services solution, whatever that is. But there is a workflow where you may have a guest speaker coming on campus or you have uh, somebody else from, um, you know, a shared uni that's coming over for a project and you want to give them um, permissions to the library resources so you can set it up manually. So you can see Adam juggling both of these by either coming in from your identity provider systemically and you can also manually create these accounts. So it's a good workflow to support both. Okay, so another question here for permission sets. Is this uh -huh. where we might set up alumni access with access to different sets of resources? Great question. Yeah, potentially. Uh, so there's two primary ways people uh, manage alumni access. Um, usually, again, every organization is different, but usually alumni have a lot less um, access uh, to subscribed content. So usually what we'd actually do is create another organization. Uh, so here I've actually got something called alumni, but it's not a unique organization. This, the fact that it's got a unique organization identifier means it's uniquely identifiable by a publisher. So if you've got your, let's say this was the main campus, the main uni. So that would be staff, students, they probably get access to absolutely everything. But then you create another organization that would have a different ID. So it'd still be, ah, we're, we're definitely the uni, but this is just the cohort of alumni so that publishers can then um, do their, the authorization from their end to give them the relevant access. Um, that's the most common way people provide alumni access. But otherwise, you could create a permission set for alumni. Um, the, the issue in a lot of cases is if they do have a completely different subscription to the rest of the uni, the publisher would just see them as a normal, um, a normal university user, unless they are using the um, affiliation or role or some form of entitlement value, but that will vary by publisher. Uh, so it's totally possible, uh, but it does depend on the publisher on um, kind of how best to um, provide alumni access. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, another question here. Is there any plan to support regional time zones? No. <laughs> so I was going to say yes. The, the short answer is there is no plan, uh, as in strategy, um, to do that, but there is absolutely 
an aspiration. Uh, so internationalization, obviously that's a massive big um, term, it could mean anything, but what we mean is uh, localization, so that uh, when you're looking at reports, uh, for example, obviously Australia, completely different um, to the UK, so you typically start uh, working on Monday, but to us it's Sunday, um, so that's not great uh, from a user experience perspective, so definitely want to do local time zones, local time, all that kind of stuff, um, and potentially um, language um, as well. Uh, the issue is we just don't have a time scale for it. So there's absolutely a desire, I argue, uh, a necessity for it, but we just don't have it planned yet. Gotcha. Um, and there's not a question here that's come in from the crowd, but I'll ask the question because I've heard it many times traveling in Australia. Um, can you talk about the um, future of API for um, getting the analytics data out? Yeah, I probably should stay back in here. Um, at the moment, to get data out of the system, I click the wrong button. Um, you need to use the UI, the user interface. And if you want the data, you need to um, download it or save to my computer. That is great for a lot of people, but it's not so great for a lot of people. Um, people use Tableau, people use Power BI, people use um, all kinds of uh, merged Excel spreadsheets with loads of data from Counter and from various other places. So yes, we absolutely need to look at an API or an equivalent, some easier method of getting data uh, without using the UI namely how we can integrate with Tableau and Power BI. So development has not started, but we've started doing the, let's call it discovery or exploratory work. So we've uh, met with lots of existing customers as well as a few potential customers, um, which is why I, I've mentioned Tableau and Power BI. They seem the absolute predominant uh, pieces of software that people are using and want to integrate with. So that's what we're going to work on first. Um, no time scales around delivery, but I think I am fairly confident that probably maybe the middle of August, I think, uh, is when we'll probably be starting a development uh, on it. That's great. That's really soon. Nice. Okay, well, are there any other questions from the group? Nothing else has come in. Looks like we've covered quite a bit of ground, both with the FAQ and the presentation. Thanks for all of that, Adam. Very well done. Thank any you. more questions? Last few questions. No? Okay, well, as normal, uh, both uh, uh, the folks from Open Athens and the folks from EBSCO are happy to be responsive to any of your library needs. So if you have questions that come up after this, please feel free to reach out to us and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you very much.